Well, friends, it is a great joy to be back here again. Uh, somebody said last night that this is like my second home. Well, I think it probably is getting that way. It's lovely to be back with you and so many of you. I haven't spoken to all of you yet. I only got here um, late last night. Um, I, I'm sorry, Joseph, I don't quite know what went, went wrong, but uh, I meant you to read down to verse 32 of the chapter. So do you mind if I read the whole section now? So can you turn, will you, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4? Mark chapter 4, we'll, we'll start from verse 21. I'm sorry, I have a different version from, uh, from, from um, uh, I hope you won't mind, but I'm going to read from verse 21 down to verse uh, 32. Don't quite know what happened there, it's probably my English. <laughs> anyway, our Lord says, and he said unto them, our Lord said, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and you will hear, and more will, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade then the head, after that the full grain in the head, but when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. We'll just read the next two verses as well. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Well, may God bless the reading of his holy word as I have read it in your hearing just now. Now this, uh, what I want to turn your attention to this afternoon, and I believe I'm speaking next Sunday, we'll turn to this passage again next Sunday, but particularly to verses 30 to 32. 30 to 32, which is called the parable of the mustard seed. Now, I wanted those other verses read because it gives the context of the passage. It gives the background and the context of the passage. Here is the parable of the mustard seed. It speaks of history, but also of prophecy. But at this point, our Lord is giving a number of miracles, a, a number of parables, which are illustrating the work of the gospel. He has begun the chapter with that, or Mark, uh, Mark has begun the chapter with the parable of the sower. And that has prompted our Lord to teach his disciples about the purpose, the meaning, and the reason for parables. Parables were not necessarily always there to let the light in, if you understand what I mean. There are people who come along and say, well, the parables are our Lord's illustrations to make the truth clear. Well, they did that to God's, to the people who were called by the grace of God. They did that to the true people of God. But to others, as our Lord tells us in verse 12 of the chapter, seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, there is a sense in which you listen to the word of God, and if you don't receive it and understand it, you come under the judgment of God. Now, my purpose is not to go into that in detail, but our Lord illustrates that with these, uh, these, uh, these uh, descriptions that he uses. The light 
under a basket? Is a lamp to be put, brought to put under a basket or under a bed? No, it is to be set on a lampstand. And he says again, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he says, take heed how you hear. I will say a little bit more about that next time as we look at this in some more detail. Because he wants us to understand that we need to hear and receive the Word of God. And then he uses this remarkable parable of the growing seed. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and sleep night and day, night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He does not know how. That is very important to understand the parable that we're going to be looking at this afternoon. We do not know how the seed germinates. The best scientists in the world can create all sorts of things, but they cannot impart life from nothing. Only God can do that. And when the seed germinates, it is demonstra- every time a seed germinates, it demonstrates the power of God to give life. You'll see that, I hope, illustrated more clearly in a moment or two. Here, therefore, in the parable we're looking at now, which is verses 30, and 30, 30 to 32, is the, one of the parables of the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, this gospel is scorned and rejected, by and large, by the world. It is unseen by the world. But there is a steady growth going on in the kingdom of God. And the gates of hell will not, cannot prevail against it. That is wonderfully comforting and gloriously true. Now, I come from Great Britain. And there are many people who think that if they go to Britain that it's like the promised land. Let me tell you, Britain is a godless society at the moment. And I could spend a lot of time telling you about that, but we are a wicked, wicked nation. And I think, I was telling the folk at Diego's church this morning in a different context, that we are being ruled in Britain by idiots at the moment by people who do not know what to do or where to turn, who have got no answer to the great issues of our nation and of our life. And what are we doing? We are aborting babies left, right and centre. We are destroying life in the womb. It's wicked. We are opposing people who stand in the open air and preach the gospel. It is wicked. Now, I preach in the open air occasionally, not as often as I used to do. But do you know it is technically now against the law to stand in our land on the public highway and say, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. People say that's intolerant because you're saying that your religion is the only religion My friends, it is the only religion. It is the only way of salvation. But you say that on the public streets of Britain and you're likely to be arrested. And there are people who have been arrested. We are a wicked nation. And everywhere you go, people are trying to destroy the teaching of the Bible from our land. Just in the last year or so, there have been doctors... Christian doctors who have treated their patients and have offered to pray for them and with them. And there are now at least two who have been struck off the medical register in Britain. They have lost their jobs because they dared to pray with a patient. Can you imagine that? I say that is wicked. That is wicked. And people think that those of us who preach in churches are wasting our times. We are fools and idiots. 
But my friends, they're fools and they're idiots because this gospel is the only gospel that can save men and women and boys and girls. This is the most glorious news the world has ever heard. And people in our country are trying to shut us up and stop us from preaching. Now what our Lord is doing here is He is telling us that however small the work of God may be, and however opposed it may be, and however difficult the days may be, God's work will succeed. God's word is sown like a mustard seed, and it will produce fruit to the glory of His name. His kingdom will be established. Now, in our Lord's day, this was a proverbial picture of something small, the mustard seed. We have various sayings in our language. We have a saying, I don't know where it came from, it goes like this, as cool as a cucumber. Why cucumbers are cool, I have no idea, but that's a phrase that people use in our, language, in our, in our country. You may not have heard it, never mind, but I'm sure you have phrases. I'm, I'm, I'm just off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not get, got back into the culture yet of the Philippines, so I'm, I'm sure there are phrases. But things that you use in common, la common language, and this was a saying, as small as a mustard seed. And our Lord uses this to make the point that He is trying to drive home. He is showing the great contrast between the beginning of God's work and its conclusion. Here is something that is small in its beginnings and yet full of abundant growth. And He does that by asking two questions in verse 30. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? How will we do this? And what he is doing is drawing importance to the following remarks he is about to make. And he t shows that from its tiny beginning, that is contrasted with the largeness of its end. Now, any seed is a small thing, and yet it contains within it life, life. All the principles and potential of life and growth and development. Do you know that this, if you hold your fingers like this and you say, you hold that in either hand, that is considered by some people to be the fish symbol, the symbol of the, of the letters of the, the, the letters of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Greek, it's supposed to be. But it's also a sign which speaks about the seed, which speaks about life. Life in all its fullness. And the principle of life is there in the seed. And it takes time and care and patience for growth to take place. But if there is true life, it will happen steady progress and development, and you can look back and see growth and progress. How true this was and is of Christ's kingdom. It would be a great joy for me to be here with your, you for your anniversary next week. Next week? Is it next week? Next week. As many of you know, I remember, I wasn't here, but I had the prayer letter from Pastor Brian of the first meeting of the church and the picture that you regularly show of the, was it 12 people who first met in, uh, in uh, Miami Street for the first meeting of this church. Small beginnings. And yet look what God has done for you over the years. That is wonderful. That is a picture of what God does. God's real kingdom was while the Lord Jesus Christ walked this earth, was almost insignificant to human eyes. The earthly life and history of the Lord Jesus is almost ignored by the secular historians of the time. There is one, I think, one comment in the Jewish historian Josephus, but in the Roman historians and the other historians of the time, there is hardly any mention. And yet, Within a few years, it would be said that
that these Christians have turned the world upside down. How wonderful if people said that today. Remember how God had made this abundantly clear in the Old Testament. He gave to Nebuchadnezzar a dream. You remember Nebuchadnezzar didn't know the dream. He didn't understand what had happened. He couldn't understand the interpretation of the dream. And he calls his wise men in. And he sets them a challenge. You are supposed to be the wise men who know everything about the future. Now you tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. The wise men said, well, uh, King, no, nobody can do that. Why not, he said, you claim to know the future. You claim to be my... It was a very, very careful and very tactful thing to do. What he was doing, he was showing that they were a whole bunch of charlatans. And he said, if you can't tell me the dream and its interpretation, it's not that he'd forgotten it, don't let anyone say that. He knew perfectly well what the dream was, but he was putting them to the test. They claimed to know the future. They claimed to be able to interpret these things. Well, if they, did, if they know that, and you know what happens, God, through, through, in, the, in the providence of God's grace, God gave the same dream to Daniel, and Daniel was able to tell the king the dream and the interpretation. And do you remember what happened? The, great, the little stone came, and it knocked down the statue. And from the stone, from that little stone, came a great mountain that filled the earth. That's a picture of our, exactly what our Lord is telling about here like a grain of mustard seed, but eventually it will take over the world, the vision of the statue and the stone. Or consider Abraham, who was called by God, Abraham, out of Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan. We're told that in Genesis, we're told that in Joshua, Joshua 23 and 24, as Joshua, as Joshua comes to give the account, how God called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, and Abraham believed God, not knowing where he went. That simple, insignificant act of obedience brought blessing, untold blessing to the world. And our Lord Jesus Christ, in speaking to his disciples, said this, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 32. And that kingdom was soon to become 3,000 and then another 5,000 in Acts and it will become a great multitude whom no man can number. And uh, on that last day from every tribe and nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation 7, 9 to 10. Now, the mustard seed still grows in Palestine today. It grows to about uh, 10 to 15 feet tall, and birds find shelter in it, just as our Lord said. And it is a picture of the gospel. We might say the gospel tree. And how many find shelter in the gospel and lodge, as it were, in its branches, because this work goes on and increases, as one of our hymns puts it, from victory unto victory, his army he shall lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Now we had some of that sentiment in the hymn that we sang on with Christian soldiers and I thought when Joseph and I were discussing it we thought that that was the hymn. We didn't get the hymn book and check it. I'm sorry about that. Again, I'm not really on, to, on to, uh, but uh, it's actually who is on the Lord's side. Maybe we'll sing that next Sunday. <laughs> okay. But the same principle is there in Onward Christian Soldiers, the same principle. God's program cannot fail because God is God. And all the principle and potentiality of life is there. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes in power to a man, a woman, or boy, or girl, he comes conquering and to conquer, and nobody can resist his will. It may be small in its beginning, but the work of the gospel is far reaching in its outworking and its results. I'm often reminded also of Elijah. You remember how he had said to Ahab there was going to be no rain. 
And then after three and a half years, with, after the great triumph against the, uh, the uh, prophets of, of, of Baal, Baal, and the prophets of the groves, uh, Elijah goes up to the hill uh, to pray for rain. And what happens? He sees a cloud the size of a man's hand. That's all he sees. But that's enough. That's enough. He knows that God has answered his prayer. My friends, we need to see that cloud no bigger than a man's hand. We need to know that God is at work. God is at work. Never despise the day of small things. But what I want to do for a minute or two that now is to consider two things. We're going to look at the sower briefly, and then we're going to look at the seed itself. What are the sower? Well, let me say a number of things about the sower. The first thing is he sowed the seed. He sowed the seed. He didn't keep it and put it on the side and admire it. He sowed it. My friend, if you're a Christian and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the seed of eternal life and you need to sow it. You need to spread it abroad. It is not just to be admired or kept. It is to be sown in the hearts and lives of men and women. He sowed it. Secondly, this was a natural act. He was a farmer. He was a sower. It was second nature to him. Are you ready to sow the seed of the Word of God wherever you go? Do you take the opportunities to speak to men and women and boys and girls? Eternal life to men and women and boys and girls. To tell of the faith that we have received. Now, I don't know about you, my friend, but I, friends, but I am still a coward at heart. I find it very difficult sometimes to talk to people I don't know about the gospel. And I find it very dif even more difficult sometimes to talk to people about I do know about the gospel. It is not easy. The devil makes it abundantly difficult. But my friends, here is a man who it was a natural act for him to do it. And you know, sometimes you talk about, we, well, we need to witness. We need to go and witness. My friends, it's not so much going to witness, but being a witness. You understand that? I can remember years ago when I was quite young, seeing, seeing firsthand the first car accident I ever saw. I remember seeing it. This woman came out of a side road and hit a car, and the car bounced off, and I've never, I, it gave me an understanding of, even though you're going at a very slow speed, the reaction can be immense. And I can remember thinking about this, and I was too young for this for the, uh, the, for the time, but uh, thinking that maybe I would have to witness or give testimony. Uh, well, I wasn't called upon to do that. That's one kind of witness. You saw what happened. But if I had been in the car, now I wouldn't have been at that age because I was far too young to drive, but if I'd been the driver of one of the cars, I would have witnessed the accident in a different kind of way. Do you understand? I would have been involved in the accident. So I wouldn't have witnessed it just because I saw it happening, but because I was personally involved in it. Do you understand? And when the Bible talks about witnessing, it's talking about witnessing in that way. Who are you if you're a Christian? How do you live your life? What do people say of you? Well, you may not know what they say of you, but we need to live our Christian lives in such a way that people know what we are and what we believe. Somebody said to me the other day, it was actually a person I've had a lot of dealings with, and I'm sorry this, if this is boasting, because I'm not trying to boast. I'm just trying to illustrate it. I've been talking to this man. He lives near us in Manchester, where we are in Manchester. And I've been talking to this man over the years, and I've been making friends with him because he has, it's an opportunity to try to bring the gospel to him. And I, the, other, the other day we had a, a, a men's breakfast at the church, and I thought the time has come to invite him. So I took the card, took along the card, and I said to him, look, we're having a men's breakfast. Would you like to come? There'll be a free breakfast for nothing, have a free breakfast, full slap-up breakfast for nothing, and then there's a little talk about the Bible. And he said, you, he knew that I was a minister. He knew that, he knew that anyway. And he said, well, he said, um, perhaps another time. 
But then he turned to me and he said this, and I was quite surprised. He said, you know, Ian, you're a person I think I can trust. Now, I'm sorry if that's boasting. I'm not meaning to boast. But I was, I was taken aback. I thought, how does he know that? I've, I, I don't know him that well, but I've been trying to witness to him a little bit and talk to him and try to explain what we're doing and talk about the gospel a little bit, and I find it very difficult, and I'm very diffident. And then he suddenly, he suddenly said to me, he said, come here, he said. And he flung his arms around me and gave me a hug. And I thought, goodness gracious me. And then he stopped and he, he, he stopped. He said, I don't do that to men, he said, like that. He said, I trust you. I trust you. He said, there are not many people I'd say that to. Now, if that's a bit of a big-headed story, I'm sorry. I don't mean it to be that. What I'm saying is, I had no idea that he even thought like that. And I'm only using that illustration to say, you don't know what other people think about you. If you're a Christian and you're living as a Christian, you'd be surprised how people take a notice of it. Be encouraged by that, my friend. Maybe you're working in a, in a, in a factory or in a, in a place of work, and you find it so hard to know how to witness. We've had a some building work going on next door to the church, not in the building, but next to the church. And um, the people who've been doing the building have been encroaching onto our land, and we've had a big battle with them. We've had to take it to the solicitors because they've, they built a wall that came over onto our land, and we said, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And they've had to knock the wall, part of the wall down. They've, they've now had to do it by law. And I was talking about this to a, in a minister's fraternal the other day, and one of my ministerial friends who used to work for McAlpine, he was at that, McAlpine's is a big building company in Britain. Big, big building company. And he said to me, he said, Ian, he said, make sure you take photographs of everything and write down every conversation and put it in writing. Well, we've been doing that anyway. He said, I used to work, I didn't know this then, he said, I used to work for McAlpines, he said, and I was responsible for a lot of building sites, he said. He said, I used to go around with a camera and with a notebook, and he said, I would always put everything back in writing. And he said, one day my, my manager came to me, and this man's name was Julian, he said, Julian, he said, you are too honest for this job. You shouldn't be in this business. You're too honest. My friend Julian, he said, who's now in the ministry, he said, I said to him, listen, he said, we have got standards to maintain. And he said, we, we have to abide by the law. He said, if we don't, we'll be in trouble, and we'll be in trouble as the firm. My friends, that's the attitude, isn't it? People think they can get away with it. But his manager had recognized that he was a man who acted under Christian principles, and therefore he could be trusted. Are we witnesses to the grace of God? A natural act. Thirdly, it was inexpensive. It cost him nothing. The gospel is free. The gospel is without charge. And yet it is a fountain of blessing. It is the free gift of God which is eternal life. That's wonderful, isn't it? Do you know, I sometimes wonder whether that is, what, that is one of the reasons why people won't stop and listen to the gospel. I don't know about you, I don't know what happens in the Philippines, but in our country we get all kinds of letters through the post. And many of them end up in the rubbish bin. And they come through the door and they say, would you like a new television? Free! And then you read the thing down and you've got to do this, or you've got to enter a competition, or you've got to do this, that or the other, or you've got to, you know. And it, it never is free, it's never really free. Or you can have a free meal, but you've got to spend this and you've got to do that and you've got to do that. And it's all, there's always a con about it. It never, it never is true. Do, do you have that kind of thing? In the, I don't know whether you do, but I'm sure you know. Always out to try and catch you out. My friends, when somebody comes and says it's free, immediately we are suspicious, aren't we? And I wonder sometimes whether people, the old devil uses that when we tell them that the gospel is free. 
Now, please, I'm not saying that that's because we do it in the wrong way, not at all. I'm simply saying that is the deception of the world, isn't it, and of the wicked one. Here is something that is genuinely free, free for the asking. Now, it cost a lot. It cost the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It cost his precious blood. It was very costly, but it's free. It's salvation that costs nothing. All you have to do is to trust him, to confess your sins, and come to him. It is inexpensive. It is the free gift of God. Now, if you want to go on serving the devil, you do that. The devil pays his wages. The devil is a liar, but the one thing he will do is always pay his wages in full. The wages of sin is death. And the devil always pays up fully. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Fourthly, the sower, this was an act of faith. Now, you might think if you knew nothing about farming and growing, growth, you would think the farmer was mad to bury his wheat in the ground, his seed in the ground, his corn in the ground. You might argue, well, that corn, I can make bread from it. What's the purpose of this waste? But the sower sows the corn in faith. He cannot tell which seed will germinate in good ground, but he sows and expects a harvest. People say that of the gospel, don't they? They say it's mad to preach the gospel but they have never seen conversions and changed lives. They've never seen the harvest. This is a gospel that works. Go on sowing this precious seed in faith. And the fifth thing about the sower is this. It brought no honor to the sower. It brought no honor to the sower. He was merely the sower. He was just doing his work. He takes no credit for the seed growing. He was simply just doing what he was supposed to do. Well, that's something about the sower. What are the mustard seed itself? Well, let me say a few things about that. I've said five things about the sower. Let me say a few things about the mustard seed. Firstly, it was small, proverbially small, a tiny seed. Again, the word seems tiny. It seems so insignificant, but you can never tell the value from the most faithful witness, however small it may be. And maybe you say to yourself, well, I'm not very important. I'm just an ordinary nobody. No one takes any notice of me, but that's no excuse because 12 disciples whom our Lord called, who were all nobodies, became the 12 apostles. And I've known of children who have spoken openly about the things of God, and they thought that nobody would take any notice of them, and yet people have heard the gospel. What does our Lord say? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings he has ordained strength. And sometimes an innocent word said by a child who knows something of the love of God can be used in a wonderful way to cause people to think. You children here, I know maybe you so those of you who can speak Tagalog can t explain it to them later, that even a child can speak a word, and you never know how God might use that word. And I have known cases where it's been the word of a child that's caused somebody to think about the gospel wonderfully. So it doesn't matter how young you are, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he can use you. Yes, he can. That's amazing, isn't it? All of us count in the wonder of the gospel. None of us are too small to be despised. Secondly, this is simple. It is a simple message. Look and live. See the Lord Jesus dying in your place for your sin. It is straightforward. It is plain. Sometimes it's scorned for its simplicity. But as Paul said to the Corinthians, we are determined to know nothing against you, uh, uh, nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all you need to know in a sense. Now, when you know that, there's a lot more you can go on to know. But it starts there, simply. It's small, it's simple. It is living, thirdly. It comes with life within it. 
Now, I remember when I was a child, we had a big house with a large garden, a very large garden. It was almost like a, a, like a, like a small allotment, a small, small holding in a sense. Twelve fruit trees at the bottom of the garden and then a large area for growing vegetables and things like that. And then a whole area which was known as much more rough ground, which was known as the children's lawn where we could play games. I was one of three children. We could play games and ride our bikes and all kinds of it. And then there was a rose garden and then there was another section about... It was a massive, massive great place and, um, well, there we are. And um, my father died when I was a child, but this was before he died. And uh, he, uh, he fenced off a little bit of ground, probably not much bigger than this platform. One for me and one for my sister. Probably a little bit smaller than this platform, actually. Probably the two of them, probably the two of them, because they were next to one another. Probably the whole thing was not much bigger than this platform. And we were given this so that we could learn a bit about gardening and we could plant our seeds. And I was a child, a young child, probably younger than most of you here then. Perhaps the little girl here, probably that sort of age. And I remember seeing my father put a row of, get a row and put a row of seeds in the ground and cover it over. And I thought, I'll do the same. So I got a row and I get in my little bit of garden and I got a row and I planted some stones in the bottom of the garden, a little, little trail of stones, just like my father had done with the seeds and I closed it up. And you know, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing grew. You see how stupid I am? <laughs> Told you I'm just a village idiot. <laughs> They'll never grow, will they? I was doing exactly what my dad did when he grew grow rows of carrots and rows of lettuces and rows of all sorts of things. But you can cut a ground in the ground and you can plant stones and you can water them till the cows come home. They'll never grow. They will never grow because there's no life in them. But there's life in the seed. And what we're doing as we're sowing the seed is we're taking away from men's minds and hearts the sea, the stones of worldly philosophy and thinking and speculation. And we're planting that which has life, divine life, eternal life. It is living. Fourthly, it is comprehensive because within the seed is all the power for growth and development and leaves and branches and trees. The gospel contains all the power for growth and development, regeneration and repentance and faith and holiness and zeal and consecration and perfection and heaven and immortality. And fifthly, it is divine, of divine creation. No man can make a seed. No scientist, no botanist, no biologist, no chemist can produce, can create a seed out of nothing. Or you can get the constituent parts of a, of a seed and you can put it together and you can make it look like a seed, but you cannot put the principle of life there without there being life originally. But here is a seed where is their principle of life is in it because it's God's divine creation. Believe and live. Not believe and do merely or even believe and be only, but believe and live. Sixth thing about the mustard seed is it grew all by itself. The sower expected it to do so and so it should we are to engage in sowing and expect to see growth. It is right that we should look for and expect growth. Week by week, day by day, week by week, month by month, improvement, growth, development, progress, slow but sure, absolutely certain. Where there is life, there must be growth and development. And if you claim to be a Christian, there must be evidence of it in your life as the days go by. The sower cannot make the seed grow, but he expects to see it grow. He expects to see fruit and harvest. Growth is the mighty act of Almighty God. The growing seed is a miracle of God's grace. We, cannot, we know it happens, but we can't explain how. Growth in grace is a marvel of divine love. Do you wonder at the power of the gospel? And if the seed takes root and germinates in your life, then there is great power for growth 
and development. Seventhly, it becomes a tree. Only a tiny seed, and yet what great results. And the emphasis in our Lord's parable is on the contrast between the tiny seed and the great growth that follows from it. The word of the gospel is only a word, and yet there is great potential in it. And conversion is only the beginning. Growth is necessary and looked for. Now, all right, you theologi theolo theological perfectionists will know that conversion isn't quite the beginning, is it? Because regeneration comes before conversion, but you understand what I mean. I'm just trying to, just trying to demonstrate it easily and quickly. The faithful teaching and witnessing of significant, insignificant folk leading to many converted. You consider the man who preached on the day when Charles Haddon Spurgeon was converted. It was a snowy winter's day in January, and the person who was appointed to preach hadn't turned up. And it was a poor farmer who was not used to preaching who was in the pulpit, and there were only a very tiny number of people, and Spurgeon, as a young man, arrived and sat at the back. And the man who was preaching struggled with the text he preached on, although the text was from the Old Testament, the words of our Lord, look and live, from Isaiah. And he struggled to say a few coherent words, and then he saw Spurgeon sitting at the back, and I, I'm not going to do this to anybody here. But he looked at the young man and he said, Young man, you look miserable. You need to live. You need to look to the Savior and live. And that was the means that God used to bring Spurgeon to himself. Do you know that man probably went home that day and thought, what a waste of time that was, that service. There were hardly anybody there. I wasn't intended to be the preacher. I guess he went to bed that night thoroughly discouraged. But God had used that simple man's testimony to be the means of the conversion of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and from him hundreds if not thousands of people were, pre were converted through his preaching in London at the New Park Street pulpit and then the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and then of course later as things developed in the Surrey Hall Music Gardens and then in the Crystal Palace and all other places. That day, that man had no idea what blessing was going to come from that preaching. In that tiny village chapel, chapel in Suffolk on a cold January Sunday with the snow on the ground, becomes a tree. Finally, eighthly, it became a shelter. There was no immediate thought in the sower's mind of birds nesting when he sowed the seed. But the one act had far-reaching results. The insignificant beginnings led to mature results in the provision of protection and strength for those who came within its shade. Again, I say the preacher of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's conversion had little idea of the far-reaching consequences of his simple address. The blessings of faithful sowing of years gone by. How many of you, maybe, were converted in a big meeting? But how many of you were converted because of the faithful witness of somebody to you? A mother, a father, somebody in the CCM homes, maybe just the faithful witness of a Christian friend talking to you about the Lord, the blessings of faithful sowing of years gone by. What a spur to greater devotion now and greater witnessing to encourage others to the work of the gospel. The birds of the air came and lodged in the branches. Blessing far beyond what the sower ever thought about. My friends, there is no limit to what God can do through you. Is this our testimony? What indescribable blessings may come from a simple word that you may speak this week, 
a simple act of kindness, a simple demonstration of the love of God in Christ as evidenced in your own life. You know those wonderful words of the hymn we're going to sing in a moment or two. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to loose his chains. The weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed. My friends, there are many people in this world in desperate need. There are many people in the Philippines in desperate need. There are many people in Cabal just around here in desperate need. What are they in desperate need of? The gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. And when God's word is preached faithfully, and I know it is from this church, may it continue to do so, and many other churches, blessings abound. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. Because God is the God of grace and the God of salvation and the God of power and the God of love. And if you do not know him, my friend, I urge you to get right with God because this gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe.